Anyway. Brethren, if I were to ask you, or if anyone were to ask you to write down in one or two sentences on a piece of paper what it means to you to have the testimony of Jesus Christ, what would you write down? And again, totally unfair. I've had several weeks to get ready for this, but it's an interesting question because for me anyway, it was a subject, the testimony of Jesus, that quite frankly, I was in the habit of reading over without much thought, never really giving it much regard. In fact, in many verses, it's sort of the main thing we talk about is this, and then it says, and the testimony of Jesus. It's an interesting question, because for me, it's like, well, my first thought, well, it's the sayings of Jesus Christ. It's his teaching. It's his understanding. That's what it means for me to have the testimony of Jesus. Maybe it's proclaiming to the world, you know, going out there and telling the world about Jesus Christ. Maybe it's the law of God. Maybe it's his truths, his doctrines, our oral or written apologetics, and our defense of core doctrines and core teachings. As we know, and it does mean this in some cases, that a witness can be a martyr. In fact, it's translated the word martyr three times in the New Testament. And I will confess, I probably shouldn't, but I will. One of the thoughts, probably one of the first, to be honest with you, when I really stopped and started thinking about it, was the sort of the stereotypical charismatic testify, you know, the, the whole thing you, I guess you see more or less made fun of more than anything. Well, the reality is all these things are indeed true. These are all elements of holding and possessing the testimony of Jesus. Even, yes, even testify. That's a part of it. Now, obviously not the way the world means it. I tickled Warren, I like that. Uh, obviously not the way they portray it, but we do have a public proclamation and testimony of God and Christ Jesus in our life. It is something that is actually quite fundamental, and as part of my thinking on this, it was my way of moving upstream, essentially. I kept moving the needle, and I kept redefining my definition, which I will share with you in just a moment. But it was interesting as the study went on how it kept evolving and kept getting, quite frankly, more fundamental, more core, more of an essence than I thought it was going to because I really thought it was sort of the Word of God and holding truths and doctrines and things like that. Just in the book of Revelation, and this is really the study that sparked this whole thought for me, we have it recorded several times. The first one is John. And again, just, just sort of a curse review. I'm not going to turn to all these for the sake of time, but you'll, you'll recognize these verses. John said he bore record of it. So, you know, that's interesting, and, and I'll read it to you. First, or Revelation 1, verse 2 says, Who bore witness of the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. So again, here John starting the book out saying, I was a witness, which really is a testimony it's the same word, the record bearer, the report deliverer, giver, going and telling all that he saw and all that he heard exactly and precisely. Again, as we know, he ends the book essentially saying, if anybody changes this, adds to it or takes away, I'm blotting his name out of the book of life. So John, had a, he bore record to those words. He had to give an accurate and a true account of what he saw. The word is a testimony. It's a, that's what it means here. It's verbal or written down. Again, it's an interesting, but he bore testimony. He bore witness to it. John also was banished to Patmos over it. A little later, in verse 9, it says, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the island of, called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So again, we have this idea of the Word of God and the testimony, which again sort of takes my initial thought, caused me to back away from it, because this indicates it's, there's at least enough distinction between them that he's delineating the two different things. And it's important to understand, at the end of the day, they really are two different things. Now, while they often can appear as an overlap, I equate it when we use this term sort of commonly with, within our, our language and our, our, converse, our conversations, you know, we've got to be able to walk and chew gum. 
Yeah, you can't really have one without the other. I get that. But again, there is something that's the word, and there's something that is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Men and women were slain for it. Men and women were killed over this. And we know in the future, Revelation tells us it will happen again. Again, I'll just read it to you. Revelation 6 verse 9 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Which is an interesting way to word it. It's something they possessed. It's something they held on to. That's an interesting word when you actually break it down. It means to own, to possess. So the testimony of Jesus is something you own and you possess. It's to hold oneself to a thing. And my favorite definition, because I think it strikes at the core of what it really means to a Christian, basically means to glue. The word held, the word hold. The testimony can be held. It can be adhered to or clung to. It is closely joined to a person or thing. This is the testimony which they held, which we hold. And again, it's another big clue of what the testimony of Jesus Christ means. A little later in Revelation, the two witnesses are killed over it. Which again is an astonishing thing to me. Revelation 11 verse 7 says, When they finished their testimony, which again, this is the words God and Christ gave them, but they finished their testimony. The beast ascended out of the bottomless pit and will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. It's another important piece of information for us to understand. It's not so much what their testimony is. It is of Jesus Christ. It is the words that Jesus Christ will have given them. The important part here is, and I think it's, an, it's a lesson we ought to keep in the back of our mind, is we hold this testimony. We hold on to it. It is glued to us until our last breath. It is glued to us whether this way or natural causes. We, it is bound, glued to us, glued inside of us till our last breath, just as it was and will be, I should say, for the two witnesses. There have been those who have been persecuted for it. Revelation 12, verse 17, that this is sort of contextually, this is part where the woman flees into the wilderness. Satan sends a flood out after her. God protects him by opening up the earth and swallowing up the flood. It says this, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those who are alive and remain, so to speak, after those, God protects a certain portion. They hold the testimony of Jesus Christ. Again, highlighting it is two separate things. It is the word and the testimony. More importantly, I think for us, prescient, if you will, for our day right now, it is how we will overcome Satan. It is a key element because Revelation 12 verse 7 or 11 tells us, and they overcame him, talking of the righteous, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. This is a fundamental element of how we will resist Satan and his influence in our lives and those all the way up until the return of Jesus Christ. And they did not love their lives to the death. Again, sort of bringing us back to that idea that we have to be clung to. This has to be a part of who we are until our last breath. And finally, angels. Again, all these to me were sort of clues along the way and caused me to adjust my definition. Angels also have it. It's not something that's unique in one sense to humans. Revelation 19, verse 10 says, And they fell at his feet and worshipped him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and your brethren which have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's an interesting statement. It's the essence 
The testimony of Jesus is the essence of prophecy. It's the essence of inspired speaking. It's the essence of God-inspired and God-breathed speaking. And in large part, what we will be discussing today. So hence, again, that's just a quick survey of Revelation, which is, for me, what started me down the path of looking at what, what is this testimony And it gets me back to the question I started out with. What does it mean to us to have, to possess, to have it clung to us, glued to us, the testimony of Jesus Christ? The testimony means, and again, dry definition in one one sense, but every instance we've read so far, it's the same Greek word, same Greek word used. In short, It means evidence given, which is not a surprise. I mean, we go to courts and we know people come in to what? Testify and give account for what they know, and it's called evidence. It's brought into bear, but it's evidence given. I'm going to use, and because the New Testament and the Old Testament use, but the same Greek word underneath is translated several different ways. Witness, testimony, record, report in the New Testament, and just testimony and witness in the Old Testament. So again, some of the verses we'll read, I won't highlight each one along the way. Sometimes we'll read the word witness. Sometimes we'll read the word testimony. Well, at the underneath, they are actually the same Greek word. But again, it all sort of pivots off this idea of evidence given. It consists of certifiable and objective facts. I kind of like that definition, to be honest with you especially when you sort of take those words and apply it to these people had the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. They had certifiable, objective facts of Jesus Christ. Is that just teaching? Is that what's glued to us? In both the Old and New Testament, it appears as the primary standard for establishing and testing truth claims. It's the primary standard for establishing and testing truth. Again, I think that's interesting. Often in um, business communication, in fact, about, well, it was probably about two years ago now, we had somebody come in and kind of give us coaching on communication style. And one of the things they told us that stuck with me is in an email, especially when you're sending it to somebody, you know, that doesn't have a lot of time. I have this belief that all executives have ADD because they read two sentences of what you have to say and none of the rest. So they gave us an acronym. It was BLUF, B-L-U-F. It stood for bottom line up front. And the whole coaching was, you better get your most important point in the first line and then give them all the details after that. I'm going to do that today. I'm going to jump to the end. I'm going to jump to what I came up with for my final definition of what holding the testimony of Jesus Christ was. Then we'll spend the rest of the time explaining it. So the good thing is, for those who want to tune out, you've got three more minutes to hang on. All the rest, you've got 40 more minutes, 45 more minutes. Holding the testimony of Jesus Christ is not subjective claims. It's not what you think of it. It's not your opinion. It's not beliefs. And it is not self-declared. And here's my definition again. Here's my bluff. Here's my bottom line up front. Holding the testimony of Jesus Christ is having certifiable, objective evidence that God is the sole supreme and central authority in your life. I want to read that again because it took me two weeks to come up with that sentence. So somebody's got to write this down. I'm counting on you, Bonnie. Holding the testimony of Jesus Christ is having certifiable, objective evidence that God is the sole supreme and central authority in your life. We say it probably a thousand different ways. I think one of the most common ways is, I have to put the words in front of it of what the testimony would mean. 
certifiable, objective evidence that Christ dwells in you. Again, there are dozens, and this is one of those topics that, that sort of blew up and then most of it fell on the cutting room floor. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of things that stem off of this. But again, on the, the idea of go as far upstream, get to the core essence of what it means. Because you can hold the truth, but if Christ isn't the central authority in your life, what's the point of it? And so that's why to me it's like all the other things. You can be a martyr. You can die for this. But if he's not the central authority, the supreme central authority, then it's not clung to you. It's not a part. It's not glued inside of you so much that you cannot rip it out without destroying your own body and mind. Everything else hangs off of this. Everything else that I could find related to having the testimony. Yes, speaking the truth. Yes, again, martyring and all these other things. But it all came back to this because none of that other stuff matters. I want to start with where we often do, the perfect example of what it means to have the testimony. I want to start with the example of Jesus Christ himself. The example he gave us, he set for us, and he taught his disciples and thereby us of what it means to hold and have a testimony. It illustrates some of the most fundamental truths to the ascent, that is essential to understanding. For us, the question that on the table today, Again, the question being, what does it mean to have the whole, or the hold the testimony of Jesus Christ? I want to turn, if you would, to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 17. Just contextually, again, I think it's, we're going to break into a story here, but to get a running head start on it, this is the section where Jesus Christ had healed someone on the Sabbath day, and the Jews were out to kill him. Because he dared to heal somebody on the Sabbath day. And his response is absolutely striking. Because he doesn't back down one ounce. He doesn't back down one inch. John chapter 7, or 5, I'm sorry. John chapter 5, verse 17. Says, but Jesus answered them. And again, these are the Jews that were out to kill him. He said, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Again, he doesn't even back, not only back down, he takes it another step. They sought all the more to kill him because not only, but he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Which again, is an interesting thought. Jesus Christ is walking them down a path. So not only am I willing to heal on the Sabbath, I'm telling you, I'm equal with my dad. Verse 19, then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, and whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Those last three words are very important for us. It is very important to understand. He did it in like manner, just like his father No other way can be done. There is no other teaching. There is no other protocol. There is no other method. He could operate under and still hold the testimony of his dad. In like manner, it is true for us. We cannot operate in any other way than and have the testimony of Jesus if we don't do it in like manner, if we don't do what he does, if we don't respond the way he responds, if we don't learn to think the way he thinks. It is Jesus' person, his qualities, his attributes, and behavior that we need to adopt because here he's saying that expressly images, it expressly tells you who the Father is, which we know he came to do. Verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. He goes on to discuss the resurrection and talks about giving everlasting life, which are things that you will marvel over. All them will, all the people today, we're going to marvel at what God is doing. 
Lest there be any doubt, he clarifies. Let us drop down to verse 30. John 5, we'll pick it up in verse 30. Jesus Christ again picks up the teaching. He says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of my Father who sent me. If if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Consider that, what that just said. Here is the Son of God in the flesh saying, if I'm bearing witness of myself, it is not true. Again, a, an extremely important truth for us that we can never forget. It is always referred to as the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is not the testimony of you. Just as Jesus Christ came to show the testimony of the Father, the testimony can never be our own. It has to be the certifiable, objective proof or evidence of Jesus Christ's supremacy. Just as Jesus Christ is telling them here, his witness, his testimony, his teaching, his doctrine, his doing what the Father has told him and teaching what the Father has told him is his witness and testimony of a greater being in heaven. His father. And again, they sought to kill him over it. If you bear witness of yourself, if you are the point of it, it is not true. We'll see a little later, he refers to it as a lie. You're, basically, your life would be a lie to do that. Verse 32. There is another who bears witness. And again, witness. These are all the same Greek word. These are testimonies. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness with which he witnesses of me is true. He's referring to John the Baptist here. And you you have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Again, John didn't bear witness to himself. He wasn't saying, I'm somebody, and this is me, look what I know. He's bearing witness to the truth, which he got from God. He's pointing people, as we know, he pointed people to Jesus Christ. Verse 34, and yet you did not receive testimony from man that I say these things, that you may be saved. And here's the point of it. It is a point of salvation that you may be saved. One of the great purposes of having that clung to you, inside of you. Verse 35, he, John, is who he's referring to here, was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. Yeah, you liked it for a while. But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me. They're bearing witness of who Jesus is. But notice how he ends it, that the Father has sent me. That's what he bore witness of. He pointed him back to his father. And that's what he was here to do. You know what in essence he's saying? He's saying his words and actions gave testimony, certifiable, objective proof that the father is supreme and that the father had sent him. He's saying his works, his life, everything he did his earthly work. Again, until he uttered the words, it is finished. Until he uttered that and drew his last breath, and even in the very act, he's witnessing in his actions and what happens there and thereafter testify of who God is and who the Father is. Again, it showed certifiable proof of who he was. And it showed certifiable proof of who sent him. In like manner, brethren, do we bear witness? Do we bear witness that Jesus Christ lives in us? Again, we're not going to, I don't think any of us will be crucified. Kind of hope not. But do our lives bear that witness? See, a faithful life lived well, will. A faithful life life 
others will see. They will see and they will understand. Not maybe now. I get that. History will not soon remember anybody in this room. It just won't. But God will. The way I look at it is history burns us up. We're a little speck of dust that gets thrown in a dustbin. Soon to be forgotten as fast as it you know, breaks the edge of the rim of the dustbin. But God will remember. It's an astonishing thing. Because we do his work, because we serve him, because we honor him, we bear the witness, we bear the testimony of Jesus Christ. They are his works at the end of the day. You and I would never choose to do this. You and I would never choose to live this life. The apostles would never have chosen to die the way they did, to dedicate their life, to walk away from all they had if it weren't true. And they are a witness to us. They are a testimony for us. Verse 37, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He's asking us to believe in something you haven't seen or heard. So yes, it takes faith. Nobody's discounting that. It absolutely takes faith. But if you believe, and yes, it's faith that's going to allow that, but if you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you have no other option but to walk down that path. And because of him, his life, his actions, his conduct, if it is in us, if we adopt that and we become like him, we become a certifiable, objective proof that he is who he says he is. And he is then our supreme Lord and our supreme master, just as Jesus Christ explained why he did what he did and who he obeyed and who lived in him and why he taught what he taught and why he said what he said and why he did what he did. Nobody would do that unless there is a supreme being up there. And for those who have faith, those who believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God, it is certifiable proof. Because you can't walk by that. You can't just ignore what Jesus Christ did. Again, brethren, we are a living, in essence, a living testimony to who Jesus Christ is and his power and his work in this earth, on the earth right now, in the race of humans, you are a testimony to that. And he's asking us to hold it till the very end. Again, you may not have wanted this. This may not have been your choice. But to this you were called. This is part of your calling. This is the essence of your calling. That's why you're here now in this life. To be a testimony, to be a witness to him. Turn, if you would, to 1 John. 1 John will start in, or chapter 5 will start in verse 9. Brother, again, everything we are, as we live in God and Christ Jesus, we become more and more a witness and a testimony to him. And it's something we hold. 1 John 5. We'll start in verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. Again, he's saying basically like how many times we go out, we'll listen to men. We'll take their word for it. We'll we'll, we'll change our life. I'll invest money because somebody tells me this is a great investment. I'll buy cars because people tell me this is a good car. People I trust. Hopefully, but you know, we'll see, we'll receive that testimony, we'll receive that witness of men. Court decisions are made, people are put in jail because we listen to a man or multiple men that tell us how it is. But the witness of God is even greater, and you can make decisions on it, you can bank your life on it. Verse 10 He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. That's why I say this is who we are, it is a living thing. Faith, if you believe in the Son of God, the witness is in himself. It is in you. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. And that's a pretty strong statement to say you made God a liar over it. 
because he has not believed the testimony that God has given his son. Again, it is a fundamental binary thing of life. It's a a decision you have to make. Are you a witness for the truth or are you a witness to a lie? We're one of the two. This verse alone tells us. There are other verses that highlight it. We are a witness to truth or we are a witness to a lie. Verse 11, and this is the testimony. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Evidence, certifiable facts. Gets back to the definition we started with earlier. Is Jesus Christ in you? Is he glued to you? Is he bonded to you so that it cannot be removed? Is he the soul and the supreme authority in your life? Even over your own will, even over your own self, even over my own desires. If he says conduct and treat other people this way, and I don't want to because they irritate at me? Who's ruler? Who's the supreme authority in my life? See, I have to subject my own self to this. He has to be the supreme, not the supreme except for me. Brethren, it is who you are, a scripture we are all familiar with. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Why? What does he say right there of why that is the case? That you may proclaim, that you may, this is not, te- this is not witness, this is not testified, but it means the same thing. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The King James says that it may show forth out of you. It means to proclaim, to publish, to broadcast. This is why you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you can proclaim it and push it out. That you can proclaim the praises of him. Not your own. Not your own super genius, which we all are. We all know it. It's him. He's the one that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise here is an interesting word. It means properly, good quality, intelligence of any kind. It means here the excellence of God, his goodness, his wondrous deeds, and those things which are, it is proper to praise him. It comes out of Barnes Notes. Barnes Notes has, actually has a really good write-up on that verse if you want to read it. But it is all about him. The testimony we hold of Jesus Christ is not about us. But it has to be manifested. If you will, it has to be witnessed in how we conduct ourselves, how we speak, how resolute we are. And I would ask ourselves, it gets back to the sermonette, how resolute are we? How firm, how unyielding, how unbending are we? Or do we compromise with the world? Do we begin to not speak as loud, not press as hard? It's manifested in your peace. And I think that's one of the often overlooked areas. How many people go through awful, horrible times and you watch them and they go through it with a certain resolve and peace? You don't do that as a human unless you have the testimony of Jesus in you because you have a greater hope. That's what gets you through it with a certain resoluteness and a certain calm and a certain peace. And again, there are a thousand other things. Having the testimony of Jesus is essentially the story of your life. It's the total story. And if it's done well, again, a life lived well, it won't just be your story. It'll be his story. And that's the beauty of it. Because 
in the millennium, it's not going to be about you. It's not going to be about your story. Just like it's really not about Abraham's story. It's not about Isaac, Jacob, Daniel, David, and so on and so forth. It's about the God behind all that. That's the story. And it will be so in the millennium. And it is embedded in so many parts of our life. It is embedded in your calling. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Again, testify, testimony, witness. It is, I think we're only going to cover three or four of these. It's embedded in your calling. Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witness. You shall be witness to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. When you get this power, which most of us have, if you don't, it's working with you. God, you're here because God's working with you in whatever capacity. He's saying, take it to the na you know, Nashville, Franklin. Take it to the state. Take it to the world. You're going to witness. You're going to be a testimony to me. But again, it is every, almost, no, I shouldn't say every time, many times, it highlights it is not of you because our witness is a him. It's embedded in our commission. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, we'll start in verse 16. He says, Behold, again, this is a commission. He's sending people out. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And beware of men, for they will deliver you out of, up to councils and scourge you in the synagogues. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake. You know, I read this, and this is why I was saying early on, it's like, I read all that, and I'm like, oh, man, we're going out wolves. You know, we've got all these things. We've got people who are going to take you to jail and curse you and do all these things. And that's what we focus. I do. That's what I read. I'm like, yeah, we've got to be wise as serpent, harmless as dove. That's important, and it is. But he ends with, as a testimony. That's why you're going there. That's why governors and you get pulled in front of synagogues you get pulled in front of religious leaders and civil leaders as a testimony for them to them and to the gentiles so yeah it's part of your commission it's going to happen but that's what we're called to do and again it is not about us it's for their benefit the witness you give the testimony you give when and if that ever happens we only go to work. You know, the best we got is to explain to our boss why we need to offer feast or the Sabbath or why I can't come in this weekend. That's a testimony. It's embedded in our conduct, as I've been largely highlighting. John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we'll read verses 34 through 35. He says, the new commandment I give you a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know. By this love, this radical love that is different from any love the world knows. Because if it was just like theirs, they wouldn't know you from it. They'd, you'd look like everybody else. He's saying, by this, they'll all know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Again, the interesting part about this is it's not a new commandment to love. It's embedded in the Old Testament. You can go look it up. Leviticus 19.18 and Deuteronomy 6.5 say you better love your brothers. That's not the new commandment here. The new commandment is what's after the comma in that sentence. As I have loved you. And you cannot do that without Jesus Christ living in you, without holding the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because that's what Jesus Christ came to do. At the end of the day, what do you know about God the Father? He said, if you see me and you know me, you know my dad. How many times did he say that? What do you know about the Father because of what Jesus Christ went through? What do you know about God the Father whom you have not seen, you have not heard, He's never come down and talked to people. Jesus Christ did that. What do you know about him? You know he loves you. There is no dad, I promise you, there is no dad on this earth, if they're at all thinking straight, that would give up a child if it wasn't love. 
Again, if we know Jesus, what he did, we know the dad. We know our father. It's a beautiful thing. That right there, that one little nugget, the Bible tells us the Greeks, sort of the Gentile world, looks at that and says, that's foolishness, that's silly, that's stupid, if I can use a word. Jews think it's a stumbling block. They can't get over it. That just can't be. That's not true. In fact, we'll, we'll try to kill Jesus Christ because he said he had a father in heaven and tried to make himself equal. For us, for those who have faith, it's certifiable proof that the Father and the Son love us. And if we, again, live a life well, a God-centered Christian life well, it'll be certifiable proof that we love Jesus Christ in time. Others will see it and others will know. Brethren, you are a living testimony to the love of God. One thing I must, I almost took this one out, but I left it in. It has to be according to God's will. Because again, we can, this is one of those areas, you know, people can get certain things in their head and get well off track. But remember what Jesus Christ said. He said, I do as my Father tells me. I speak what he speaks to me. I love because the Father loves me. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Again, it must be according to God's will. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed of the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by our Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Again, confirmed. They testified of him. Verse 4. God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, what? According to his own will. Your call, your witness, if you will, there is things that are common to all of us, but there are others that are not. Miracles and gifts. There are reasons for signs, miracles, wonders, gifts and a testimony and a witness to him. These are, again, all of those things are certifiable evidence, but it is according to God's will. Not everybody is an evangelist. Not everybody has to go out and fight those battles. There will only be two witnesses. God mercifully shelters the majority of people during that time. There's only going to be two that got to do that. Outwardly, these signs, miracles, wonders... They are clear evidence. They are evidence of God's supreme authority over all things and evidence to all within the church. It's the message of salvation. It's true. It proves it's true because we have these things and we can look at it and say there is no other way. These, again, this confirms it. These are witnesses to God. Somebody's healed. It's not for their glory. Just like, again, I'm going to... I'm going to rant here a bit, I guess. It's not to God, it's not condemning somebody because they weren't healed. Sometimes it's God's glory that they're not. Healing is a credit and a glory to God. Praise Him when it happens. And don't condemn somebody who isn't healed. Okay, done ranting. Inwardly, inside of you, this is really where I, my primary focus has been, but it is a witness, those signs, because you have them, brethren. You have miracles in your life. There isn't a person here, I don't think, that could come back, and if you thoughtfully went through and chronicled your life, wouldn't find some miracles somewhere. That's a witness to you that you are a child of God. It means something to you. Paul himself in Romans 8, 16, we won't turn there, he declares, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. In the simplest form, the fact that some of this makes sense. I tell my daughter this all the time. It's like if this even makes sense, it's evidence. that It is certifiable, objective evidence that God is working with you. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to respond to that? How do we respond to it? 
But again, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And we have a grand purpose. We serve an amazing God that has a purpose. Again, if you think about God's plan, he could have done this, I don't know, 100,000 different ways. This is what he chose to do. He chose to have first fruits. He chose to have those he would call now so that they could serve a purpose at some point. It really takes us back to all the verses we read in Revelation of the purpose and talking about those that held the word of God and the testimony up until they died. They held on to it, it was clung to it, and they were witnesses, and they you know, sacrificed their life for it. I actually want to go back to the Old Testament. This is actually the only Old Testament reference we're going to have. But if you would turn back to Isaiah chapter 43. Because Revelation talks about those who lived it, those who stayed faithful until the very end, and many of which died for it. They died for what you and I hold. Again, in one sense, this is a slightly different question, but it completely overlays on holding the witness of God or witness of Jesus Christ. Purpose of the first fruits. Why does he have this? Why has he called people since Pentecost and brought them into the church? And I know there's predates that, but why Pentecost? Why, why is he out here just calling nobodies into his, to, to, do, to do something? Again, history will not remember us. There is, you know, I get it. If, you, if anybody here becomes president, you'll, you'll have some books written about you. But we're going, you know, time goes on. We're going to be in the dustbin of history, long forgotten. Why is he doing this? Why this? I think this is, this is a striking small section here for us to read. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I kind of like that. I like the idea of reading. I've been redeemed. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for you for ransom, Ethiopia and Seba, your place, in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, I have been honored, or you have been honored, and I, I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. We're about to go, and we're about to observe a festival season doing this very thing. Bringing God's people back from wherever the four corners of the earth they are. Verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, who I have created for my glory, I have formed them. Yes, I have made them. Bring out the blind. Yes, Bring out the blind who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. What a blessing. Those who cannot see now can. Those who could not hear now can, both metaphorically and literally. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us, show us former things? Let them bring out their witness that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it is truth. You... O oh, Jacob, O oh, Israel, you are my witness, says the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen. You, brethren, are God's witness. Your life, the fact that you exist in Satan's world, and the fact that you persisted, the fact that there have been those who did it till their last breath, are a witness says the Lord, you are my witness and my servant who I have chosen, that you may know and believe me 
and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Again, brethren, this is the essence and core of the understanding of what it means to be a witness. Your very existence is witness to this. It is a testimony to our great God. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Again, is he a supreme authority in your life or not? Is he your hope or not? Verse 12, I have declared and saved. I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord. Why? You're my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Brethren, once and for all, your life, your existence, and again, I, I don't mean now, the days we're about to go into, what we're about to picture, what we're about to under, you know, rehearse, which we do every year, when those happen, when the real events occur, your life, the fact that you persisted, the fact that you stayed loyal in the face of all opposition, in the face of all the world had to offer, the fact that you held on to the testimony of Jesus Christ till your last breath or until Jesus Christ stood on the earth and clearly afterwards will stand as a testimony for millions of others. They will know what you know, because today, you see, today they already see. There are millions of people that know Jesus Christ died. There are millions of people who believe He was here. God's going to use you as an example to disprove one fundamental thing. He's going to use you to disprove the lie Satan has told every human being that God really doesn't care for you. You will be proof that he does. You will be proof that it can happen. You will be proof that God is faithful. You will be proof that God is loving. You will be proof that God is true and everything he said is true. You will be proof that there is no other, as we just read, there is no other God. You will be proof that he is the only hope for every single man, woman, and child. In other words, brethren, you have been called to be a witness, a testimony, a proof that all the claims of God are indeed true.